Well, I want to thank those of you that came uh, last night. I heard a good report from Bo's Revelation study material in the evening at 5 o'clock. Uh, there were eight people that came last week. I want to make sure you know you are invited tonight uh, to be a part of that study. Uh, so we'll find you next is the Great Buckeye Town at State Park. That means it's going to be closed across the dam over here. So to make a little extra time around, uh, please use direct traffic to the red light of Columbus uh, to make sure you're here on time for Sunday school at 9.15 and 10.30 at uh, Next Sunday, though, Cheryl will be traveling. A young man named Bryce Bradley uh, from Florida is going to be coming. He's a student at Cedarville University. Uh, he is going to be bringing a message to Dan. I want you to be here to encourage him as he brings his message next week. I'm going to ask you to turn in the scriptures this morning to the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. And put your finger there, we're going to be in just a moment in John chapter 10. You know, I'm convinced uh, as I look into our world that God is doing some things that we are truly honored uh, to be a part of. And no matter where you are today, personally, if you're here, maybe some of you are attending on online with us, I'm convinced that every time we gather in the name of Christ, we have something to share with us right here and right now. And so this week we're kicking off a new series uh, called The Road Trip. And with some of us obviously travel, some of you have vacations planned, and depending on who you are and where you're going, your mode of transportation might, might vary. Some of you, you'd like to go everywhere. Now maybe you're a, a coach person, maybe you're business class, uh, the way cost is going down, I'm seeing all the flying cargo, but uh, maybe some of you, you're just a first class Some of you, you're going to jump on a cruise ship and sail the seas. The, less, the rest of us, we're kind of left to drive wherever it is we're going. And just to kind of get a feel uh, for everyone who's here today, uh, just by a show of hands, I'm going to take a poll on the longest road trip that you have taken. How many of you, and I want to ask you to raise your hand, you have been on a road trip that has gone at least four hours long. Raise your hand. All right, good number. Now, uh, if you have gone on a road trip that has taken uh, eight hours, leave your hand. Wow, okay. Anybody who has been on a road trip that has lasted 12 hours, half a day in the car? Wow, you guys. I want you to know if you have taken a 12 hour car trip, that, that was a mistake. Uh, you didn't, didn't enjoy, enjoy it, it. And, and I know you didn't enjoy it because no one is still friends. Family, family they, they start, start to rewrite their will after 10 hours of being in the car alone with the family. family. Uh, you should have flown, okay? If like, you've been in the car for a whole hour, that's, that's my free advice, advice to you next time you travel. travel. Uh, no matter where you're going <laughs> or how long it took you to get there, I guarantee you that you did not travel on the side as much as my young family did as I was growing up. We took two separate trips that I would never, ever forget. One of them was to the Florida Keys, and we took it in this beauty right here. No kidding. My dad spent so much money renting an RV that three meals out of the day we would live off potted meat and crackers. The third meal they actually went off of spam and eggs. This is cat food. This is not pea food. I'm sorry. I came I back with two souvenirs, souvenirs from that trip with Cousin Eddie and his RV. A, a jar of sand and shells and a necklace, necklace made out of those little keys you used to open the spam cans. That, 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 that was my own. God knows you know, know what those are, okay? okay. The other trip we took, we took was a trip to New York City, City that we took in style like this. A 1972 Ford Country Squire station wagon. This is the classic car that time forgot. For a reason, okay? okay. <laughs> this car could go from zero to 60 sometime, okay? Eventually. Whenever it got around, the best feature of the station wagon was the very back seat would flip around the back of it. And so you could sit in the back and watch all the people laughing at you as you drove past. And, and this was with my mom, my dad, me, my nephew, and my aunt and uncle. Imagine it's going through six lanes of inbound traffic in New York City. And I'm just watching people thinking, you know, there's a family that they will not hug while they're here. I mean, obviously. Uh, and, and I remember those trips because they were so special. No matter how long it takes to get to your destination, you know the key to successful road trip is having good navigation, right? 
You got to have a tool to get you to point A and point B. And our tools of navigation in the have changed considerably over the course of my life. How many of you remember when you were a kid, you traveled with one of those maps that's folded up, right? And you had to be able to solve a Rubik's Cube. You never had that map that's folded back to the way it was originally designed, right? Uh, but you would take that, and sometimes you'd have a whole collection of those book called an atlas, right? And, and, and you'd take that atlas on the road, even if you were going to Cincinnati, Ohio, it was completely known. You'd also have a map that could get you to Rhode Island if you lost your way to about Rhode Island, right? Uh, just in case. Then with the advent of that new thing called the interweb or something, right? That tool entered our life. In the early days of the internet, and those of you that are under 30, you can find this hard to believe. You could only access those directories by going onto your desktop computer at home. And how many of you remember something called MapQuest? Remember that? You type in your destination, you get this two, three page sheet of turn by turn directions to get where you need to go. Now, the problem is, the very first second you made a wrong turn, all that was irrelevant, right? You can either backtrack and figure out where you're turning from, or you can just keep going hoping that you cross some sign of life. It's, it's where your wife would look at you and say, we need to stop and ask for help. And every husband would say, absolutely not. <laughs> if Magellan can circle the globe, Lewis and Clark can cross the U.S. without us as a record, I am not going to ask for help. There's no way you can stop and ask for help. An hour later, you stop the gas and you go in. While your wife is in the car, you just say, look, I'm lost. Can you help me figure out where I'm going? Now, today, you and I have mobile map apps on our phones, right, that help us get around. You can be an Apple Maps, a Google Maps, you can be a kind of person. And our phones can be record that. Turn by turn, like they can tell us where the road hazards are, where, where the police are watching out for us. And, and there's even this very traditional and slightly uh, Australian or British voice of the program that tells you what to do. And we become so dependent on our phones to get directions these days, sometimes we don't even know the names of the streets in our own neighborhoods. We just do whatever the phone tells us to do. Now, whether you've ever slowed down enough to think about it like this or not, Every single one of us, friends, we are navigating this one and only life that we have to live. There are twists, there are turns, there are detours that we could have never planned on, never seen coming. And as the journey into this kind of life that we want, we realize whether it's the kind of family we want to have, the kind of marriage we want to have, the, the kind of career we want to have, sometimes we just don't have the navigation that we need to get there. It might even be the eternal destination that you want to secure for yourself, and you're just not sure. You've got it locked up right here, right now. And we're going to need some help getting in. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to unpack a couple of big truths. So the first one sounds like this, and you've got an outline there in your bullet. It's very simple. You are following someone. You're following someone no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been at it in this life. You're following something. It might be a voice. It might be an influence. It might be a worldview. It might be a specific person. But no matter where you are right now, you are following someone. Some of us have chosen that person intentionally. Like, I want to be just like that grandparent. I want to be just like that grandparent. I want to be just like this individual. Their character, their impact, their influence. I want to live that kind of life. Obviously, as a minister, I think you get jazzed up about the challenge for direction and navigation like Joshua 24 Where you give that challenge to people, choose for yourself this day who you'll serve. Whether the gods that your ancestors served on the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in the land you now live But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And we've done so, many of us knowing at least in part that doing so will involve carrying a cross. The Apostle Peter said that this is your call because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Other, others of us have simply defaulted to the loudest voice in our life. And some have even, according to Paul, and friends, this is the day, this is the time that we're living in now. He said, the Spirit clearly says in the latter times, some will abandon faith. They'll follow the deceiving spirits and things caught by demons. 
And some of them that are going to the way they follow Satan. We're all followers of the Lord. So, so the second thing that we need to look squarely in the face, the face is that, that, that who you follow, friends, will determine the direction of your life. Where you end up, at the final day of on this earth, or somewhere in your life, is a destination absolutely determined by who you listen to, who you choose to follow. And I know that there are some, even in this room, who like to think they're independent, that we're in control, that I am, that I am, so to speak. That I'm not following any single individual. I blaze my own trail. I'm a trail setter. I'm here to tell you, there is a voice that is helping you make those big life decisions and your life. So we'll be determined by my own father. So how does that show up in your life? Every day, you and I make decisions that are small decisions. They don't think of them as a big deal. The clothes you chose to, 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 to wear today, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not those shadow. Even if they were to wear one of those kilts or something here and or be working today, today, it would be rude shadow. Questionable, because his wife might be here and take clothes. But, you know, it's not those shadow. Whether what you had breakfast, what you had for breakfast, not the big news. Podcasts, playlists, what's going on your view. Alone, that doesn't change anybody's direction in this life. But there are those big times, time. those who grown up, huge decisions that we have in front of us. And I'm talking about the decisions in the moment, where you're consulting this voice in your heart or in your head that helps you decide it. It might be decisions like, should I take this job? Should I go this direction? With my, I got multiple opportunities in front of me. This one is going to take me and my family far from our sources. It's going to take us away from friends and family. Now, my income is going to be so much greater than the impact of what I can do, and that's going to be more, but it's going to put a room to this challenge. But if I stay here, it's going to put a cap on what I can make and what I can do. But I will be close to this family. Which is not going to take. And there's a voice that helps us determine the difference between right and wrong, good and bad lives, and unwise and helpful and unwise. It might be a decision. Do, do I speak to my grandparents? Do I speak up to my children and, and talk to them with their involved? They're getting into some serious relationships. Some serious relationships that can lead them away from living a faithful kind of life or a future. And any time you bring up the faith with them, it is discomforting to me. Maybe it even brings up a fight. You're just not sure. Do I bring it up and risk this relationship? Or do I stay silent? And keep the companionship. Maybe a, a, a parent is where you're trying to figure out what do I want my kids to do? Do I get them involved in sports? Do, do, do I take a public school or pay for private school? Stem a gap? Do, do I keep them home? Do we just let them watch the TV movies or the TV movies or our movies? Am I going to let them sit right now with that new friend that they do not have some strange vibes from that girl or that guy? And, and, and when you're making these kinds of decisions, there's a voice you're following that will determine the direction of your life. For some of us, the voice that we hear every time we make a decision in our life is the voice of our parents. The voice of our parents. And it actually doesn't matter to us how old you are. It doesn't matter if your parents are living or if you're gone to be with the Lord. There's that voice that brings loud in heads because they are so influential in our lives. And when you have a decision on your hands, in your mind, you're having to explain it or justify it to mom or dad. And if that's your voice, often it leads to a people-pleasing mentality. We end up asking the question, what will make everyone happy? What's the least device and what's the least dramatic decision I can make? Because I'm going to keep the waters calm as much as I can. I'm going to keep everyone happy, even if I'm miserable. Even if I'm not happy, and if and everyone, everyone else is happy, happy it's okay with me. You throw in the weight of, of some proof texting, texting as well, well, you know. Well, you know, the Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 12, of honor your father and mother. So, so no matter what they say, I've got to do things in my life to please them, right? Dangerous theology. And dangerously out of context. And guilt produces. Maybe the voice that you consult in your head is the voice of your friends. I mean, we have to admit that friends in this life, the people we hang out with are incredibly influential. And 
that the almost everyone in this room, you probably got a moment. You probably have a story in your life where the only reason you did something is because everybody else was doing it. And I hope that's not a detrimental story in your life. I hope it doesn't, doesn't involve any kind of penalty corporately. But that's true about all of us. Sometimes we just go with the flow. And so we ask the question, I really don't know what to do. So what is everybody else doing? That's all I do. I just want to fit in. Sometimes the less I notice, <laughs> the better it is. It increases the likelihood of you staying connected and having a friendship space. It increases the likelihood of that and the less likely that I'll face rejection. So I'm supposed to go with the flow. Maybe you tried to please your parents and that was a dead end to you. Maybe you tried to, to please your friend in a place you would and a place you really didn't want to be and so now you've eliminated everyone except for one. And now you choose to listen to the voice of yourself. Every decision you have, a single question that you ask yourself is, will this make me happy? Will happiness, is it my ultimate goal? And I pursue my desire in this moment, irregardless of what everybody else is saying. Irregardless of what everybody else is doing. And you care, irrespective of anything past, present, or future, what they've told me, or will tell me to do, or I told you so. Is this going to make me happy? Would you read this out loudly from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18? Let's read this together. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. You see, my way or the highway has one destination, a train wreck. So over the next few weeks, we're going to ask a simple question. What if the voice that I chose to follow was that of Jesus? What if it was Jesus' voice? What does that look like? As believers, I mean, come on, this is where the rubber hits the road. Do we honestly believe the voice of Jesus will lead us to the destination we deeply desire? If we do believe that, it will change everything about our decisions and our life today. Do we crave the sense that John the Baptist had in John 3.29 when he said the bride belongs to the bridegroom? friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. So we're going to ask this question. Like, can, can I know that joy? Can I have that sense of completeness? Is God still speaking to me or is it kind of done? Can I hear his voice? Is it beneficial? Would it even make a difference to me if I follow what Christ has to say here for me? Is it enjoyable? That's a huge question. Does he really have my best interests in at heart? When I need to turn by turn navigation, why is the voice of Jesus better? For Jesus himself said in John 5, 25, very truly, I tell you, the time is coming and is now come. When even the dead appear, the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. So here's, here's, here's the foundation. Out of all the voices that you can listen to, all the influences, all of the, the directors you have at your disposal, why choose the voice of Jesus? When it comes to the things that I like to do with the resources in my life, things with my body, how I spend, what I see in other people, the people that I can be close to, who I choose to love. How do I live with my spouse? How, how do I become an influencer? Who am I going to listen to? The voice of Oprah or Joe Rogan in a podcast? I can listen to the voice of anyone. Why would I choose to listen to the voice of Jesus? Because I want us to respond with obedience clearly before we finish here today from Hebrews 3 7, as the Holy Spirit says today. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. I, I, I don't know how much of the Bible you have read before, but you have probably heard much of what I'm about to read in John 10 chapter. Jesus leads us to this kind of life. From John 10 10, straight from, from the words of Jesus himself. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. He said, But I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. The message paraphrase says, I have come to give a more and better life than they have ever dreamed. The New Living Translation says, My purpose is to give a rich 
and satisfying the land. You know, I think if we poll our friends in the general public, I don't know if those are two words they would use to describe Christian life, rich and satisfying. I think they would say any time the Christian life is in and their perception is dry and boring, or it's arrogant and judgmental. Maybe you see some examples in your own life, and you might hear the words in on and phone but it's straight from Jesus' plan to give you and give me a rich, satisfying life. So are you living it? I don't know about you, but that sounds amazing to me. And in order to experience that kind of life, we're going to have to choose to listen and follow the voice of Jesus. Now look with me, if you would, back at the verse 1 in John chapter 10. And, and, and before we get to that last time around, Jesus is explaining himself, or, or explaining himself to all the people that are following him. All the people that are listening, he's trying to make this well-rounded picture of who he is, of where he's come from, and what he has come to do. And he often uses these statements, these I am statements. He would say things like, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and I want you to hear this this morning. You may not know who you are. You may not know what your choices are before you. You may not know, you know where you're going or what to do. But if you focus your eyes on Jesus' eyes, as I am, you will find peace and purpose and wisdom for your life. In John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, Jesus is going to tell you how he feels about you. Now, what you think, what, when you know what he feels about you, he's going to do two different things. He's going to, one, he's going to hurt your feet. I hate to tell you that. It's, it's going to hurt your feelings, but afterward, he's going to tell you the greatest thing that you have ever heard in this life. So here we go. John chapter 10. We'll start in verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, very soon. Anyone who does not enter the sheepshead by the gate that climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am. The gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters the me will be saved. They'll come in and go out and find us. And again, the thief only comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I've come. They might have life, and then they might have it to the full. Now, as you hear what Jesus spoke about, did, did you catch the imagery that he used there? And I don't know if you know this, but he, he actually did say something with her feelings. In this metaphor, he's going to refer to himself as the gate, he's going to refer to himself as, as the shepherd, which makes you and I, what? We are sheep. All right, it's 4 a.m. here, time, right? You can go, you can look at the sheep there, you can see them at their best. But Jesus, he had the opportunity to compare you and me to any creature, to any animal in the entire Animal kingdom. He could have said, Bill Warren is like a majestic ball of eagle. He didn't do that. Okay? He didn't say that you are like a tall silver backed gorilla or the majestic African lion or golden retriever. Again, referring to me and my mom, he said, He could have said he is like a sleepy, tucky thorough. Nope. He looked down at everyone else and he said, Sheep, 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 sheep. Sheep, 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 and so on. You know what sheep, sheep are famous for? Sheep are famous for being defenseless and helpless. In the absence of a shepherd, all sheep do and get often get in trouble. They will want to off most likely. Uh, they are easy prey. They will attack a cowboy job. That's what sheep do. When you let other animals loose, they will run. They will be excited to go explore the world. Some animals even have that instinct. They'll come back on their own. Not so with sheep. 
They'll just mosey off until they bump into another sheep and they'll follow that sheep wherever it's going. You can find a sheep at the bottom of a pit or a ditch, you can pull it out, you know what they'll do? They'll jump right back in the same ditch. Same old toxic places, same old toxic sheep. And friends, alone, we always end up on we always end up in the same ditch of regret, same old pattern of bitterness. And Jesus says, I am the shepherd, and you're the sheep. He's making direct eye contact with each one of us. And he's saying, I know you. I know your needs. I know sometimes you want it off. And I know right now you kind of feel lost. I know right now you're scared. You, you wish, wish you could do this on your own. I know you're way down at the bottom of who you are. And I know you and who you are down at the depth. And friends, if you're anything like me, that's a terrifying thought. Because in my mind, I've convinced myself that anybody who knows me to the depths of who I am, all the way down, there's no way they would stick around. They wouldn't love me. They would not even encourage me. They wouldn't stay in a relationship with me because if they knew my true sweetness, they would fail me. There's no way they could love me right now. Jesus has just told us. He knows us all. There's not a single moment, not a single decision that you've ever made or will make. It hasn't been for him. And you might be nervous to know that he knows everything about you, but I want you to allow him to speak for himself. Let him share with you. What he feels. Look at verse 11. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The higher man is not the shepherd. He does not know the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons but runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a higher man. He cares nothing about the sheep. I'm a good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the father knows me. And I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. That's what it feels about you and me. Friends, Jesus is an extraordinary shepherd. He does things that no other shepherd would ever do. And when you have to decide, which all of us do, who you're going to follow, can I suggest we follow the good shepherd that does what no one else would ever consider. Here's how I want to put it in that last point. Is Jesus a good shepherd even when it doesn't feel good? Now, now why would I put it that way? We've already established that sheep are dependent. They're always needy. They always need someone to look out for them. There was a guy named Douglas McMillan. Douglas McMillan was a British minister, and, and also in his life, he spent time as a shepherd. He describes what it's like to lead sheep. He says sheep often get lost, and they, won't, they mosey off to some area, and it's the shepherd's job to go and find them and rescue them and bring them back home. But sheep don't respond to being found like other, sheep, uh, other animals do. When sheep are found by their shepherd, they panic and they run. Sometimes the most loving thing a shepherd can do for a sheep is to tackle it like a linebacker, coming over the middle, take it off its feet, wrap it up, uh, wrap up its hooves and throw it over his shoulders and take it back home. Meanwhile, he said, the sheep have to be thinking, ow, <laughs> what is this dude's deal? He just tackled me. I can't move my feet anymore. He's bound me up. I'm over his shoulders. This hurts. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign a waiver for the shepherd to treat me this way. Why is he doing this? This does not feel good. And friends, if you've been following Jesus even for a little bit, that's why I ask you the simple question, is he a good shepherd even when it doesn't feel good? Psalm 119, 71 says, yes. It was good for me to be afflicted that I might learn your decrees even when it doesn't feel good. You see, there's seasons in our life where we started following God maybe because we thought God's going to solve some things for me. He's going to help me get my life cleared out of the past. He's going to smooth the road that was before me. I'll get some things that I've never had before. And then suddenly we're in the season of turmoil. We're in the season of waiting. Or maybe right now you're in a season of confusion 
or a, seri- a season of, of frustration. You might even be mourning the loss of someone that you love and you know this does not feel good. And in all those seasons where it doesn't feel good, we're tempted to look back at the shepherd and say, are you sure you're really good? Do you know what you're doing? Because right now, all it feels like is I have been tackled and bound up and I'm not in control anymore and I'm not sure that I want to keep following you. And may I just gently remind you of something that I have needed to be reminded over and over again within my life. Friends, the shepherd knows things that the sheep do not. It's possible the most loving thing that the good shepherd could ever do right now is to allow a season of pain and brokenness in your life because he has a greater plan. It was the apostle Paul, great servant, great open, humble leader before God at times who would say in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, even I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, and I pled with the Lord Three times he would say to take it away from me. But the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That's why for Christ's sake, he said, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties because when I am weak, then I am strong. The good shepherd knows what strength you need, friends. And the good shepherd knows his sheep by name. In verse 3 again, it, it said, he, the good shepherd entered the sheepfold and calls him by name. Douglas McMillan also said it. It wouldn't be weird for a flock to know uh, the voice of their shepherd. You could imagine a shepherd walking into a sheepfold that has a lot of different families using the same area. They need to know the the voice of their shepherd to be called out. But he says, no shepherd ever names their sheep. It's a level of intimacy that no one else would go to. And Jesus raises his hand and says, I do. I know each one of them by name. I knew you when you were being knit together in your mother's womb. I've known you every second of your life. I've known you at the best moment of your life. And I've known you at the worst moment of your life. I know you. And friends, I hope you'll take some encouragement that the God of the universe, who spoke everything into existence, he knows everything that you or I will ever speak, ever touch, ever experience, and he knows you by name. And he is intimately involved with your life. Here's the last thing. He knows what you need. He knows the strength you need. He knows you by name. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, friends, the shepherd knows the sheep are valuable. Going back to the time that Jesus spoke, the shepherds back in the day, they weren't offered IRAs and 401ks. There was no such thing as market investments and so on. They traveled with their wealth. The sheep were their wealth. And so when Jesus tells the story of a shepherd who'd be willing to leave 99 sheep in an open field to go and find one lost one, in one sense it makes sense because each one is valuable. But Jesus says, I would actually not just go looking for you. I would die for you. No other shepherd would ever do that. Other shepherds may protect, they may provide But no one's laying down their life for you. And Jesus raises his hand and says, I did. I already read the verse in Isaiah 52 this morning. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. He will be highly esteemed. But first, just as there are many who are appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, his form marred beyond human likeness. Friends, you and I will have countless influences, countless directions, countless voices that we can listen to on this road trip of life that we have. And it's going to require a choice for us to say, Jesus, I I choose you. I forsake all others for you. And may I suggest that of all the other voices we have at our disposal, not one of them knows what is best for us. But the one who knows you by name The voice of the one 
who laid down his life for you, he can lead you to the destination that your soul most wants to arrive at. I'm going to ask you to stay with me if you would this morning. I want to pray for you, with you, for us. And if you have a decision to say, you know what? He raised his hand for me. He said, I know you. I know your sheepness. I know the strength you need. I know that. I know your name. And I would give my life for you. And now it's your turn to say, Jesus, I raise my hand for you. I need you to be my Lord and Savior, to take my sin, to give me the life that really is rich and satisfying because it only comes through him. Maybe you've been listening to the wrong voice all your life and it's time to listen to the one voice that matters the most. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for the the beauty, the gift, the metaphor even that you would speak yourself. Not only are you the gate that we can walk into, not only are you the voice that matters the most, you're the good shepherd. Despite knowing every single thing about our life, despite looking deep down at at, at every wrong path we've taken, at all the things we would just glory in at times and say, yeah, this this is wonderful. You know the best and the worst, and you say, oh, but I know your sheepness. I know you're gonna wander. I know you're gonna stray far, but I'm gonna come running, looking for you. And I might bind you up, and I might allow a season of pain within your life, but I'm still good. And I'll carry you back to the fold. I'll carry you back to the blessing of the life I have for you. I'll put you back on the right path to the right destination because I love you. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the restoration you alone can provide to that path. So in whoever's life you're working today that something needs to give, Father, let your spirit do its work in Jesus' name. Amen.